It's an esteemed honor for the Central University of Punjab to host this sociological gathering, which is going to cast light on different aspects of sociological domain. Now, I request Dr. Vinod Arya, head Department of Sociology, to introduce the forum with the objectives of symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Sali. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, and uh, uh, Dean of Academic Affairs and today's Acting Vice Chancellor, Professor P. Ramarao, the faculty members from different streams, Dr. Tarun Aroda, Dr. Naresh Singla, Dr. Amandeep Sir, and Dr. Jubli, Dr. Sandeep Ji. I welcome all uh, uh, from law also. Uh, and to start this teaching learning center approved in January actually uh, of 2018 this is basically the second event where uh, we are starting with we have conducted one inaugural in this and to start teaching learning basically I requested my students to learn this opportunity to introduce others so we have started within the program the methodology of this and uh, with the thanks note again to our uh, keynote speaker professor vivek kumar who will be introduced later on in this program uh, it's really very difficult to basically uh, commute to batinda in many terms and still people of, who are basically so busy in their schedule and one more professor who is waiting there he'll uh, soon join us so basically looking at the trouble which they have to join us we we are sincerely uh, we are thankful to them they visit us and they enlighten us with their other things uh, most uh, and not the least my also thanks are due to the participants who have come across the country from different places hope we will be joined by some other participants who are just stuck uh, somewhere around uh, around to batinda so let me introduce you to this whole concept actually the teaching learning center are 25 in all india they have been approved by Ministry of Human Resource Development. This is the one within that 25th. This holistic uh, basically or component is under the program of Pandit Madan Mohan Malvi, a national mission on teachers and teaching. So basically what we are going to do in this uh, basically five days, I'll quickly take you through that so that we can all understand what we are going to do and what we are going to do. And what I have thought about in the beginning or planned to do is that as many of the participants can contribute to their best ability may contribute kar sake sirf passive listeners ki tarah we do not want here speakers will speak and then we will try to engage everyone and brought out their experiences so we can enhance the teaching learning process eventually as i have told the background which remains for teaching learning centers or which we have proposed and got approved is basically teaching learning process has gone through many changes over the decades with globalization and modern changes basically there is a demand of new methodology of pedagogy how to teach how to deliver because this is in against to or somewhere binary to basically eurocentric approach so here we are not going to basically evolve some new thinkers only within different disciplines which we have six disciplines within this teaching learning center one is sociology political science oblique international relations economics we have literature studies we have environmental studies and one more is which i am somewhere missing uh, that will come uh, in, in in time so within disciplines we are going to basically understand how the content can also be delivered within the context of indian society and within the context of regional areas or demands looking at the global demands or understandings because we have to compete with our systems with these international demands and institutions so we have to place ourselves on that and uh, as we are, uh, I also apologize for being a bit late in our program, but anyways, we'll, uh, we'll try to cover, up, cover it up. So let me also say a few words about the Central University. Among 12 other Central University, our Central University of Punjab was established by Act of Parliament, number 25 of 2009 Act, and it enforces or it envisions to basically bring interdisciplinary researchers and innovations within this. Coming back to my TLC or our TLC, objectives of this proposed project is what we are going to, we have clearly defined three objectives in which first one is 
to comprehensively enhance curriculum incorporating the intellectual traditions of Indian history and culture and there's where we have to shift from dominant Eurocentric perspective number two which is very important is that we are going to enrich the methodology by using the participants experiences in teaching learning and focusing on analytical and problem solving approaches not only just remaining to teaching part but hum apni padhai likhai se kaise un samasyao ko jo hamare saamne shayad azadi ke samay se ya usse pehle se abhi tak bhi waisi hi chal rahi hai aakhir unka samadhan khojna bhi inhi disciplines ka उद्देश्य होना चाहिए जो हम कोशिश करेंगे इसमें लाने की और तीसरा इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट जो चल रहा है दैट इज टू क्रिएट अ डिजिटल लाइब्रेरी सो आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट और विल लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट एवरी स्पीकर हेयर दैट वी आर गोइंग टू रिकॉर्ड दीज लेक्चर्स आल्सो एंड बेसिकली पुट देम लेटर ऑन ऑन मिनिस्ट्रीज वेबसाइट एंड अदर थिंग आर टारगेटेड क्लाइंटल आर बेसिकली द टीचर्स हु आर टीचिंग एट ग्रेजुएशन एंड अब लेवल सो वी हैव डिवाइडेड दिस होल प्रोसेस इन टू वन पार्ट विल बी रिसर्च विच यू विल एंगेज लेटर ऑन इसी टीम में से कुछ लोग रिसर्च का हिस्सा बनेंगे और आपसे सवाल जवाब उसमें पूछेंगे जहाँ यू कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट एंड यू कैन टेल वॉट शुड हैपन विद इन दीज डिफरेंट डिसिप्लिन एक इवेल्युएशन विंग भी होगी जो फर्क नजर करेगी कि शुरू में जब आए और प्रोग्राम खत्म होने के बाद हमारे पार्टिसिपेंट्स हमारे रिसोर्स पर्सन कितना डिफरेंस देखते हैं सो बेस्ड ऑन दीज एक्चुअली वी विल डेवलप एंड वी विल ऑल्सो शेयर द थीम बट लेटर ऑन नाउ लेट मी क्विकली बेसिकली रिक्वेस्ट द एक्टिंग वाइस चांसलर ऑफ टुडे एंड माई डीन ऑफ अकेडमिक अफेयर्स Uh, despite of basically being a declared holiday they all are in up support and what has been there in background i can tell you later personally but it has been a constant cooperative academic as well as organizational support which i at least and our team members are thankful to him from the bottom of our heart and i basically welcome professor p ramarao to just uh, say a few words for this program before the keynote address thank you Yeah, Professor Vivek Kumar and uh, faculty members of Central University of Punjab, guests and participants and their students. Uh, basically, he explained the uh, the project was submitted more than one year back and it was awarded actually in January and commissioned. Um, today's uh, environment uh, in MHRD daily there are changes. we are not able to understand and we are not able to cope up also and the new items and actually their requirements what they are asking uh, in fact actually 3 days back i was attending actually the reforms examination reforms uh, uh, meeting and uh, now actually they have sent actually on july 18 there is another item which is called actually now it is a learner oriented not any more the teacher oriented teacher centric it is a learner oriented and uh, they have given actually a time table also to submit actually and the uh, learning outcomes based curriculum framework so these are the new actually aspects uh, and already 37 subjects have been identified and sociology is one of that particular actually 37 actually the subjects uh, to frame actually uh, learner oriented actually the outcome based the curriculum development so in that particular case uh, it is not only what we teach uh, what is the outcomes you have to write down and how actually these students who are actually specialized going to be specialists in actually the sociology and they must know what are the skills and actually the what are the knowledge to meet actually the requirements of the knowledge world the knowledge economy and as you mentioned competitiveness because uh, you are actually the students uh, are going to compete globally and they have to actually withstand uh, this particular thing so everywhere why this is happening only one word which is actually the budget word that is the quality of higher education this is what exactly they are talking about it and uh, uh, critical evaluation and uh, active participation in this particular actually programs are essential i hope actually uh, you will also concentrate on the new demands which are coming uh, from the 
ministry. In fact, actually the last date was over, uh, uh, August 25th was actually given. That is actually the site which is there where the sociology address is also given, uh, email address. Yeah. You can actually the, take it and you can send your actually suggestions that is the learning oriented actually the outcomes uh, curriculum development uh, already we have started uh, on the fundamentally in our institute the curriculum audit uh, which actually any new concept comes society always uh, oppose it and uh, my faculty members also opposed the uh, curriculum audit but ultimately uh, there is actually an action and a reaction and automatically a solution in your sociology that is what you people find out and the uh, auditors as well as the faculty members they found a solution they submitted actually a requirement of the curriculum audit I hope you will find actually in the present uh, uh, symposium several actually the solutions to the sociological problems which are actually the facing uh, on this country and this society and I'm not going to stand in between uh, you and the speaker. Thank you very much. Best of luck. Have a nice actually proceeding. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much, sir. May I request Rebecca Matthew, student of MA third semester, to introduce our honorable keynote speaker very quickly. Professor Vivek Kumar is professor at the Center of the, for the Study of Social Systems, School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University. As a recipient of Fulbright's Teachers Fellowship, Professor Kumar was, vis was visiting associate professor in the Department of Sociology and a resident at the South Asian Institute, Columbia University, New York, USA. He also taught a course, Social Exclusion and Inclusion in Indian Society in the Department of Sociology, Columbia University, New York. His publications include Caste and Democracy in India, a perspective from below, the edited volume Dynamics of Change and Continuity in the Age of Globalization, Voices of the Margins, India's Roaring Revolution and Dalit Leadership in India. Professor Vivek Kumar has supervised a great deal of students. Dr. Kumar was chairman sub subgroup on awareness generation, statistic and monitoring innovation and research for the formulation of the 12th 12th five-year plan 2012 to 2017 by the Ministry of Empowerment and Social Justice, Government of India. Dr. Kumar was a member committee on mid-term appraisal of tribal sub-plan and scheduled caste sub-plan of the 11th five-year plan constituted by the Planning Commission of India. Central University of Punjab welcomes you, sir. Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor Ramaraji. Uh, dear colleagues, of course, the chairperson of the TNC, uh, Dr. Vinod Arya, it gives me great pleasure to be with you. Always, uh, whenever we go to young universities, we always meet a confluence of young scholars and of course very experienced scholars so it's great pleasure to interact at two streams of the society i know how you know the Arya used to come to delhi and uh, used to talk about this whole tlc program and how he was supposed to interact with the uh, vice chancellors of other universities and he was only an assistant professor I still remember that how he came and one day said said they are not giving me any bhav what to do but ultimately I think uh, the university supported vice chancellor supported Ramaraji and other have supported and the young university has got such a prestigious program I think this is feathered in the cap and I congratulate one and all for this wonderful achievement. I think there's going to be, this is, uh, this is uh, going to be a new beginning as far as knowledge production is concerned. And India, as we all know, is at threshold of challenging the Western philosophies. And they are trying to build up. They are 
indigenous knowledge system. I think that's a great uh, challenge. Uh, and in that particular challenge, I usually, I am, I am involved in challenging the uh, sociological concepts and I've written also, you could read a few articles were written by me. Uh, now in that context, I was asked to uh, talk about that how the whole concept of sciences and social sciences have evolved in the Western society and whether there was something parallel to Indian society. Now in that sense, I think it's very uh, easy for me to begin with that uh, society, the societal reality to begin with were understood by the approach that is called as theology. Theology was the first uh, approach to understand the society that God has made all and rest is basically the supernatural power has made it all even your happiness your sadness your uh, illness all is made up by supernatural power that was the beginning where which we start and later on as we all know that philosophy overpowered theology and uh, the inquiries in philosophy if you see is considered to be mother of all social sciences philosophy is considered to be mother of all social sciences and as we move on we look into that how gradually near about seven in 17th century nearly at 17th century each uh, each aspect of philosophy started achieving its own independent status and therefore cosmology which was known as philosophy of cosmology became astronomy and physical philosophy became physics and later on different disciplines like chemistry biology and uh, psychology geology all started one by one creeping in after 17th century but friends to reach that level this philosophical notion if you go by uh, other sociologists or social scientists they will argue that philosophy lost to sciences and when it happened 14th century 14th 15th century after the scientific revolution philosophy was relegated to periphery I was talking to a uh, dialogue between science and social science and when I argued that science emerged first than the social sciences people uh, said that oh it's news to us we always thought that social sciences was always there social sciences uh, emerged after the scientific revolution they did not know so I think I thought that yes it is good beginning that we should also try to understand that how did scientific revolution took place and after how have social sciences emerged at what time and what was the uh, process in which social sciences has emerged so to begin with there was theology then came philosophy and after philosophy there were different sciences which have emerged but to reach to scientific revolution i think we also need to bring in the two uh, very important and dominant perspectives in western society or western social sciences and this i have taken from P peter winch who is talking about uh, under laborer debate under laborer and master scientist debate now this debate argues that philosophers do not produce uh, they do not produce original knowledge they are dependent on sciences and John Locke argues eloquently saying that in the era of Eugene's, New Boyle's, Charles, Newton. Now they are the people who produce the real knowledge. And the philosophers are only clearing the impediments in the language and linguistic aspects. Now 
this is something great injustice to philosophy because we have just argued that philosophy has been the mother of all social sciences and sciences and now here John Locke is saying that science is parasitic parasitic on science uh, philosophy is parasitic on science they do not have their own independent subject matter now this is where I think it's uh, it's uh, Peter Winch argues that okay if I say philosophy doesn't have its own subject matter then there are two very important aspect of philosophy one is metaphysics and another is epistemology now metaphysics as you all know metaphysics as you all know talks about that how construction of this world has taken place over the years and epistemology talks about source and foundation of knowledge what is the source and foundation of knowledge what is the limits of knowledge what can be known with certainty and what can be left to what can be left to is speculation now these two aspects are in a, a internal aspect of philosophies if we say that philosophy is parasitic on science then what you are going to say about two disciplines we all know that in philosophy there are different disciplines still and we practice those disciplines these are of course logic is one of the important metaphysics epistemology aesthetics these are all parts of uh, philosophy so we should keep in mind that philosophy is still exists exists in its own form the second dialogue is between uh, philosophy philosophy and science what is the relationship between philosophy and science and this is given by Thomas Kuhn in his book uh, structure of scientific revolution he argues that people say that it is the if science is really producing the real knowledge till when their real knowledge lasts and how did scientific revolutions take place and I think there are sociologists they understand the simple argument given by Thomas Kuhn who says that 99% of the scientists practice the proved formula they practice normal science whatever the formula exists even today even the satellites work on Newton's third law of motion and that was proved long back so scientists work on the proved formula most of the time it is only when their paradigm and I'm talking about paradigm in terms of the theory the law the instrumentation with which they work club together is known as paradigm when the paradigm fails to explain the phenomena or the new reality then and then only scientific revolution takes place so paradigm change basically leads to scientific revolution and there are examples that how from heliocentric uh, from geocentric to heliocentric this was the paradigm shift then from Astro Aristotelian physics it goes to Newtonian physics and from Newtonian physics how it transfers to Einsteinian physics we all know that there have been paradigm shifts in the sciences and then sciences scientific revolution takes place but the important aspect is that what happens between paradigm shift the old paradigm has not yet gone obsolete and new paradigm has yet not been has not yet been established what happens in between the two and Thomas Kuhn says that it is this time the scientists are debating between themselves what is happening how you have to solve a problem what is this role Thomas Kuhn asked this role is nothing but role of philosopher scientists are becoming philosophers 
so the role of scientists as a philosopher and then philosophers establishing their uh, paradigm they become again scientists so there is no static relationship between philosophy and science the philosophers are scientists and scientists become philosophers and this goes on so these are two different paradigms in which science uh, philosophy was looked into in the uh, uh, in in the past now coming to <coughs> the origin of science i think is an important aspect and a link that how philosophy moved we all know that uh, uh, if you if you define science let me define science for you uh, it's a very simple definition i have taken and i'm not talking about the content of science rather we deal it uh, science is an approach to knowledge which is more calculated and disciplined than ordinary inclination we are only talking about it is an approach to knowledge we are not talking about laboratories we are not talking about oh scientists their hairs are there and here that's just if you if you have watched a film how scientists are actually you know having long hairs uh, and they are in apron their apron is tattered torn here and there that is the image we are not talking about that we are talking about simple science as an approach to knowledge which is more organized and disciplined than ordinary inclination i give an example to my students when i teach that when that's the difference between calculated knowledge and ordinary observation is when we are waiting for bus this side we usually feel that bus this side are more in number इधर तो बस ही नहीं आ रही है इधर तो बहुत सारी बस आ रही है बट दैट इज एन ऑब्जर्व नॉलेज दैट इज एन ऑब्जर्व नॉलेज एंड देर फोर हाउ विल यू मेक दिस ऑब्जर्व नॉलेज एज साइंटिफिक वेन यू आर वेटिंग फॉर अ बस दिस साइड से इन जे एन यू वी वेट फॉर सिक्स फिफ्टीन दैट इज द बस सो इफ यू आर वेटिंग फॉर सिक्स फिफ्टीन ऑन मंडे टेन टू इलेवन एंड देन यू काउंट द नंबर ऑफ बसेस विच कम दिस साइड the frequency is stand this side and also on monday 10 to 11 and count the frequency of the same number of bus not the other buses you have also you have organized your knowledge that is what is scientific knowledge nothing great about experimentation laboratory pipette burette whatever i am not talking about that it's only an approach to knowledge i i think this gives me lot of lot of uh, say power to argue that what is difference between philosophy and science philosophy is only waiting for his newton to arrive otherwise they would their star would also be uh, you know shining at loft but this approach to science when did it begin when did it begin and what was the first step towards science according to soberge net the first step towards science was observation of a pattern in the environment observation of the pattern in the environment what pattern after dark it will be light after uh, thunder there will be uh rain all these actually you know patterning and observation of pattern broke the confines of confinement of the individuals individual could organize and reorganize their whole society their whole community and their whole life after in the darkness they used to go in the cave and after that they used to look into come out in the uh morning now this is way actually we look into that how social uh, sciences began the first step towards science the earliest step taken now if you specify the time period of the scientific revolution is of course 14th and 15th century and uh to arrive this stage there were seven and eight stages i will just read out uh quickly so that you can register you all know otherwise you can read there's a very good article by soberge net uh in method of social sciences 
uh, Sobergen Net has written this article. So discernment and pattern was the first step. The second pattern was emergence of technology, weapon and uh, farm equipment that help the people. Invention of organization was the second step. Uh, third step which helped the pre-industrialized civilized society to do farming and find actually an irrigation because without settlement without organization you cannot have farming you cannot have irrigation fourth step was that it gave birth to settled life an economic life economic surplus emerged and there emerged also certain people a leisure class which emerged and the fifth was birth of cities some 5500 bc cities were born literary class was born that is the sixth and seventh civilization was born now in this civilization one of the most significant aspect was writing invention of writing why invention of writing is an important aspect and you see that uh, there was a tough of uh, tug of war in Indian society also 15th century we understand Kabir how Kabir is talking about tu kehta kagat ki lekhi main kehta ankhan ki dekhi this was impressism you are saying you are looking book view I am talking about field view I think this uh, this was there within the Indian society and that's what I am trying to argue that how this whole aspect of literacy is important literacy important and invention of writing accelerated the tempo of social and technological change why why did it change it changed because invention of writing uh, also led to accumulation of knowledge not to accumulation of knowledge it also led to diffusion of knowledge written words could be diffused from one space to another in very 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 fast manner otherwise orality you cannot take orality to every side orality was confined to a particular place uh, even written words also help mathematics mathematics to evolve to establish without written notation mathematics is nothing so written uh, words and literacy was a very important aspect of development of science but the sad aspect of literacy was that it started debunking orality orality was looked down upon and Indian society also we had a whole tradition of orality all Smritis are having orality they were all oral later on codified but we had a strong tradition but we never thought and we know that Westerners have talked about that Indians do not have history if you have read communist manifesto and one page only written history he is talking about Marx is only talking about written history oral history was no history for them and therefore I think it's important to look into that how this happened now coming to the knowledge of the literary class during that period what was the nature of knowledge of the literary class and also uh, uh, juxtaposed to the literary class was there any other type of knowledge I will come to that later so let me just look into that how philosophical knowledge emerged but considering philosophical knowledge was considered as speculative knowledge especially the literary class the literary class produced knowledge without interacting with nature they did not go to the nature and interacted and produced knowledge they sat down contemplated from their mind observed and produced the knowledge uh, this was an important uh, consequence of uh, you know they did not interact with the uh, nature why did they did not interact with the nature it is said that they did not interact with the nature because there was uh, they were in awe with the nature that if they interacted if they disturb the nature then dire consequences will happen agar prakriti ko chhedoge to tumhare upar kahar hoga isliye they never went and this is not only in indian society i am talking about outside world that they did not interact also also they did not interact with the nature because they had disdain for handwork 
having labor they did not interact with they did not soil the hand with them and therefore they did not or they could not manipulate the nature however if this was the pra this was the philosophical knowledge of the literary class there was another type of knowledge which existed in the world and this was knowledge of the working class the knowledge of the working class the artisans the merchants the peasants they were all interacting with nature and they produced practical knowledge now before we elaborate this let me give you example of philosophical knowledge uh, i was talking about they did not interact with nature and this philosophical knowledge is given from the medicine medicine uh, uh, area and i am talking about hippocrates hippocrates uh, and also uh, if you take the uh, roman philosopher or roman physician g c gallen g c gallen was roman uh, roman uh, physician whose writings on anatomy remained final authority of on the subject for 13 centuries Tera so saal anatomy ke chhetra mein G C Gallen ki theory abad akat thi. There was no one to challenge, but G C Gallen had never performed a dissection. He had never performed a direct dissection. And when Andreas Vesalius <coughs> performed the dissection on the human body, human cadaver. human cadaver you must have seen munna bhai mbbs who were dissecting actually on the human cadaver uh, they found that gallen's theory was all farcious all farcical all wrong now this is i am giving you example from uh, one that is medicine there may be many other examples i am not going into that detail and therefore it is said that greek science there's a difference between greek science and the modern science greek science was subjective it was only rational it was subjective it was rational and it was purely intellectual it is started from the mind and explained the phenomena on the basis of self knowledge it never had you know experimentation but they seldom new experimentation this has been written and greek science was not modern science of course is objective it is metrical and it is experimental and therefore there is a great difference between the two system and therefore friends i was trying to argue that there is one aspect of knowledge which is philosophical knowledge of the literary class which was produced without the experience of the environment interaction with environment but there was another type of knowledge which was produced by interaction with the environment and it is here out of the uh, out of the confluence of the two types of knowledge the philosophical knowledge of the literary class and the working knowledge the practical knowledge of the working class over the years abundance of knowledge this was posited in 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 the society and out of the confluence of the two practical knowledge and the philosophical knowledge science was born in 14th century so to have a disdain for philosophical knowledge and actually keeping the scientific knowledge at higher pedestal is really really difficult and therefore i think as a social scientist we should look into that what happened now why did or what was the impact of scientific knowledge that is important for us as social scientists one it broke the medieval social order and also question the institutions like church it question the institution like king and europe became the center of knowledge philosophy as an important source of knowledge was relegated to periphery but for us most important aspect was understanding of cosmos changed understanding of cosmos changed after the scientific revolution what was the change 
the world before the scientific revolution was considered as infinite world immeasurable infinite world but after scientific revolution it became at least its circumference became known and we all know how Columbus started from one place and went or reached to the another place just because he had a very different type of notion of circumference how Vasco da Gama came to India this was an important aspect that the notion of the cosmos changed the change was from, from also from geocentric to heliocentric Copernicus we all know that how the world did not take the the notions from Newton Galileo Bruno all these people uh, the church the king did not take the notion of scientific values into and we all know how Bruno a scientist who talked about that look this this land or this world is this land uh, this land is or the earth is not stationary he was talking about copernicus bruno was only talking about copernicus that how earth is not stationary he was burnt alive and that happened in europe you can understand how uh, uh, things as scientific revolution galileo Galilei was also jailed newton was also you know forced to do something Descartes, the philosopher, was actually moved and he was moved and he took his uh, notion of questioning a little bit with pinch of the salt. So all this terrorizing atmosphere, some people put behind the bar, some people burnt alive. This was the impact of scientific revolution and yet world was changing. A new concept, new notion of the world was emerging in uh, Western society. So what was there for social scientists to take? Social scientists, the impact of scientific revolution on social sciences. This brings us that social sciences are going to be born. Social sciences were not there. It was philosophy through which we understood. It was literature which we, with, with which we understood the world. But social sciences were not there. Now, social sciences were born in 17th century, 16th and 17th century. This is the time when people say that things started crystallizing. The first, the first discipline to born was history. Then, second was of course economics. The third was sociology fourth was political science fifth was anthropology sixth was orientalism and geography psychology and law were not considered as social sciences the three disciplines were not considered as social sciences and after the second world war another discipline that is area studies was born area studies with multidisciplinarity was born you can read will bacon commission report i think uh, emmanuel wallenstein deals with that six disciplines three disciplines not considered and seventh of course after world war but to reach that space to reach that level what is important for us to understand four distinct revolution which ushered one was of course the scientific revolution we have seen that how scientific revolution impacted the second was after scientific revolution was commercial revolution commercial revolution broke the geography after emerged after the geographical explorations took place after scientific revolution and it is with the commercial revolution people reached to different cultures they started understanding the different cultures. They started appreciating the different culture. The absolutism was broken. And that's where, you know, uh, seeds of social sciences were being sown. The second revolution was industrial revolution. 
I'm just trying to rush industrial revolution as you all know that it changed totally it emerged in England and people say why did industrial revolution emerge in England because it was more egalitarian the hiatus between workers and the bourgeois were less उस वहाँ पर जो वर्कर थे और जो धनाढ़ वर्ग थे उनके बीच में डिस्टेंस बहुत कम था और इसलिए इंडस्ट्रियल रेवोल्यूशन यूरोप में भी इंग्लैंड में सबसे पहले आई और इसने जो चेंज किया दे चेंज एटलीस्ट सिक्स और सेवन पैरामीटर्स ऑफ द सोसाइटी वन ऑफ कोर्स इट बिक इट 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 चेंज द प्रोडक्शन सिस्टम फ्रॉम फैमिली टू फैक्ट्री दैट वॉज द प्रोडक्शन सिस्टम चेंज ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी द लैंड वॉज सपोज टू बी land was supposed to be most precious now rupee became or the monetary became important emergence of new organizations banking system new types of factories new types of companies and you all how can you forget east india company it was the emergence after the industrial revolution the emergence of new classes the working class and of course the migration of population development of urban centers and also the pain and agony of the masses it is said that people thought that after industrial revolution there will be more leisure time people will be more happy but what was happening now there was more pain there was more exploitation there was agony and therefore philosophers started trying to understand what is this what is this happening and they try to make sense that look this poverty this exploitation this pain is not natural in nature this is man made and if man has made this we can also understand that's the role of philosophers in understanding the social sciences are getting their their roots into it the third revolution is of course the french revolution 1789 to 80 1795 this is the revolution why i am calling it revolution it did not only revolutionize the french society but it revolutionized the world with the cardinal principles of equality liberty and fraternity now these are these are important this revolution is important because it brought the social for the first time social being with individual rights with the fundamental rights was at the center earlier all were subjects the king's world was lost but after french revolution it was the individual which became in the center the social was born in that context french revolution is an important uh, contribution now 16th and 17th century friends therefore is an important marker 14th century revolution took place and before that i have tried to argue 505 bc where philosophy were looking at this now here a new discipline is getting born and this is social sciences so how do you define social sciences now i also take this i also treat social sciences is an approach to knowledge fine but this approach to knowledge attempts to develop systematic and secular knowledge that means this worldly knowledge when i when i say secular means this worldly knowledge bereft of extra terrestrial power bereft of i am trying to argue that uh, it is trying to understand not the power of supernatural world it is trying to argue of this world and this knowledge this secular knowledge about the reality this can be validated empirically if you can validate your knowledge empirically then you are doing social science again so social science attempts to develop systematic knowledge about the reality that is somehow validated empirically secular knowledge and this is basically in the construction of 16th century now was social sciences born on its own or was there a handy work of the state or elites of the society whether elites had some interest 
they were responsible for the emergence of social science or it was a natural phenomena which was growing therefore friends what happens that it is said that modern states we all know that europe was in turmoil that is 14 15 16 century europe was in turmoil there was lots of revolution there was lot of conflict we all know wars in the western world or european world now the elites were always in danger <clears throat> the ruling elite they were in danger they used to think that they can lose their rule and they can rule their empire anytime they can lose so there was an urgency of the ruling elite there was an urgency there was a legitimacy also to understand why there is so much of commotion it is not out of blue that Durkheim writes about social solidarity why he is talking about again and again social solidarity why Marx is talking about revolution because there was and that's where I think one of the thinkers very good uh, um, social scientists uh, C. Wright Mills talks about three coordinates of sociological imagination three coordinates of sociological imagination one biography second history and third their interaction in society these are very very important coordinates which takes me to Japanese sociology and Japanese sociology if you look into Japanese sociology is one and this is the article you can read the, 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 the Japanese name is Shikai S-H-I-K-A-I Shikai Ishikiriyon S-H-I-K-I Shikai I-S-H-I Ishikiriyon Hmm? Shikai is Kirion. This is uh, uh, Shikai is Kirion in English translated to is a special type of consciousness. Now, this article tells us that how Japanese sociology did not borrow any of the Western theories and concepts, they went to raw impressism they went to their own societies and we all know that at that time after Miami's revolution how Japanese society how Japanese society was trying to reinvigorate reconstruct itself but they did not borrow the Western concepts and Western society I'm not against Western concept like that but I'm trying to argue that you can make your own sociology by imprecism by empirical data not necessarily relying on the western theories why did why did uh, japanese sociologists did not rely on western concepts i will give you one example to prove the point that earlier earlier there was most rampant marxian understanding of the japanese war especially world war one world war two people were trying to understand world war one and world war two and the, uh, the the decimation of japan by marxist inclination and they argued and they accepted that it was the bourgeois interest it was the interest of the business elite which led to war and of course why because people thought or the 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 theory marxist theories told that the interest of the business elite was that once war is over they will be getting they will be getting most of the uh, most of the um, construction works their companies will benefit this was the rationale given for uh, Japanese war but what happened people said okay business elite had their own interest and they they were ready and they could really definitely uh, put this honors on the whole society but how why did penury strike and masses accepted this theory why did the masses accepted this theory what was their interest 
but this was not explained by that and then Adorno Adorno's personality the dominant personality the authoritarian personality is started coming in and that's where friends that uh, this whole notion this whole notion of empiricism within the sociology within their own sociology I think has a very valid point and there are different shades there are different shades of uh, concepts and theories and perspectives which dominate I can at least give you seven shades you know French sociology is dominated by Newtonian physics and therefore pot positivism dominates there Newtonian physics has you know very very important impact on social sciences four very important impact on social sciences one Newton talks about that if you can know the initial stage you can know the final stage that was one contribution and the social scientists took a leaf from that that if you can know the origin of an institution you can know the final uh, stage of the institution and therefore in social sciences every social scientist started looking about the origin of the institution people talked about origin of family or, or origin of property origin of law they started having origin which is not the case really that if you know the origin you can know the last stage that was a physicist known as Karl Popper talked that that is basically nothing but historicism which is sterile which produces no result that is one important second impact of the Newtonian physics on social sciences was that Newton argued that every phenomena every phenomena every natural phenomena is governed by a law according to Newton every phenomena natural phenomena is governed by a law and therefore social scientists also took a leaf if natural phenomena are governed by leaf so should be social phenomena also and therefore you know how a French sociologist Auguste Comte gave law of three stages theology metaphysics and scientific say so law was another the third important aspect of Newtonian physics was essentialism essentialism how heat was understood how in physics how heat is understood heat is understood with the rise of mercury in a thermometer so basically we are not able to observe heat we are not able to observe heat and yet we can see rise of mercury and we have an essence of how much heat is generated when we have a metric we have a meter and this essentialism brought to social sciences again by a French sociologist called Emil Durkheim who said that we cannot see solidarity but we can understand solidarity by rise of crime in the society we can understand mechanical solidarity we can understand social solidar uh, organic solidarity by rise of population these impacts are very very important the the impact of Darwin theory on social sciences evolutionism as Darwin talked about this was British this was British social scientists in Britain if you see all the social sciences are talking about evolutionism as the societies evolve so as the organic in organic uh, you know organism evolves so the social sciences evolve also the society evolves now these are very important aspects of you no know, impact of sciences on the social sciences that have to be brought in and when we question the existing so uh, exi existing knowledge system I think we should take this in point and that you know brings me to the last point that each social sciences each social sciences has its own epistemology that is an important aspect without understanding the epistemology you cannot deconstruct the existing theories existing concepts what is epistemology let me explain you again with the, before we come epistemology 
ask question about the nature and scope of human knowledge what is the nature and scope of human knowledge that is first thing that means what can be known with certainty and what must be left to faith and opinion this is one of the aspect of the epistemology so you should ask with each concept what is their nature and scope what can be known with certainty and what is left to faith the second what is the proper source and foundation of knowledge this is what uh, is understanding you all know that there are five sources of knowledge that is basically the sense perception and i'm not going into that but there are four other sources of knowledge one is authority that you can know with the authority you can go to the authority and you can understand tell me this reality authority will tell the another is uh, the mystic mystic way of understanding you go to a mystic uh, a, a person who really practices magic or has mystic power and he will say that this is going to happen you can understand the third to understand is logic ra logical rational way you have your own logic and last the fourth is the scientific way these are ways of understanding the sources and foundation of knowledge last but not the least epistemology also asks the criteria you evolve a criteria to distinguish between scientific knowledge and non scientific knowledge i told you that how buses are this side and that side so you can understand that these are three very important components of epistemology if you really want to understand a theory and a concept and social each social sciences has its own epistemology history the way before social sciences were born history was written as hagiography राजा महाराजाओं के चरित्र लिखे जाते थे बान भट्ट चरित्र लिख रहे थे और अकबर नामा लिखा जाता था ये उनकी प्रशस्ति में लिखे जाते थे उनके गाने गाए जाते थे दिस वॉज द हिस्ट्री बट इट हैड नथिंग टू डू विथ सोसाइटी एंड देर फॉर हिस्ट्री वॉज कंसिडर्ड दैट लुक न्यू हिस्ट्री विल गो टू आर instead what it should be what it is it will search what it is and it will go to the site and write so people had okay if it goes then whether we can have universal history people said no you cannot have universal history history has to be ideography particularistic because each culture is different you cannot have and and also that will save history away from philosophy because philosophy gives universalistic principles but history was trying to be particularistic the second discipline economics how economics what was the epistemology of economics economics was actually based on universalistic universalistic psychology everyone has in every individual universalistic individualistic psychology every individual in universe has a psychology of consumption everyone will consume there is a tendency and therefore the second aspect was that there should not be any control of a state on market laissez faire you have to give them freedom these two components of economics gave its uh, gave its uh, um, epistemology and therefore there was nomothetic laws if you see in economics we have universal laws supply and demand you can have also other laws but now it is changing but i'm talking about at initial stage then the third discipline the political science it had also its own epistemology we all know that earlier political science was not a discipline political economy was one of the component of the economy the philosophy part was taught in law people argued that look political economy cannot remain together because politics economic this dependent on profit and politics is dependent on welfare how can welfare and profit go together and therefore it has to be dissociation so politics was brought from there 
and they it needed a little bit more uh, flesh and they brought philosophy from law and it became political science so the third uh, discipline sociology emerged out of social reforms social reforms the 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 whole human inclination uh, 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 the pain and agony suppression the exploitation of the masses became the epistem epistemic say of sociology anthropology was born with a very different epistemology of the other cultures the colonial masters the colonial masters wanted to understand the other cultures now these people had four very important criteria to whom they wanted to understand one they did not have written records they did not have a standing army their religion their religion was practiced in a very small place and they were actually not part of the mainstream they were called as tribes now therefore how will you understand them understanding them was that you go to them you live with them you try to understand and therefore participant observation as a method emerged that you have to go and live with them and holistic studies that was another epistemology which emerged that you cannot understand tribal in isolation each institution cannot be understood in isolation it has to be understood in the holistic banner and therefore anthropology with its own subject matter with its own epistemology was born there was another discipline orientalism uh, i was talking that how orientalism was people went to the other cultures who did not have written records who did not have a standing army but there were other cultures who had written records china arabs india they were all having written records and these written records have to be understood but the people did not know their language and therefore linguistic power had to be developed these in these written records have to be understood and that's where it has to be understood with appreciation because they were also developed and therefore orientalism was born psychology was not considered a social science subject because it shifted and drifted towards biology law became a profession not producing any knowledge on its own but only uh, preparing individuals to practice law and therefore it was not social sciences geography was much more in the terrain physical terrain rather than human and therefore at that time it was not considered a social science discipline but when the world war 2 came the world was divided into 16 regions we all know that how the world was divided into 16 regions from russia to africa east west north south central and um, europe east west central and then middle east then south east south uh, south asia all these 16 regions but they have to be understood how to understand the power of american society was so much that they were brought under one roof and all the disciplines were brought under one roof and multidisciplinarity and area studies were born now this is in a nutshell uh, history of social sciences sciences philosophy and theology i think before we harp on to deconstruct these i think we should also engage with them interact with them so that when we try to deconstruct we are knowing the nuances of these concepts and therefore a new knowledge which evolve and i think new knowledge evolves in the ecology in which it exists thank you thank you so much thank you so much uh, professor vivek kumar we are honored and i hope so after listening to such an elaborate uh, analysis of social science and its connection with uh, science uh my objective is somewhere achieved or whatever we collectively thought that why to invite faculty members from this different disciplines philosophy psychology law geography orientalism although we don't have literature studies so basically it it's philosophically and logically proves why we have kept the eligibility criteria not only as sociology and this because there has been a philosophical connection between these things 
so again to thank sir and i would like to mention few more names and i'll say sorry if i'll forget some of the more names but it is important to basically underline these names as such to tell and thereafter we'll move for tea uh, outside it is important to signify because this work which has been or it is not my show it is a collective show and for which i would like to thank the director of teaching learning center professor v k garth in his absence he has made all support me even on phone telephone whatever i said he has been always there and i have nothing to say again professor p ramarao academically in terms of any infrastructure support i would like to thank him dr tarun arora managed you things for me anything i asked him i would also like to mention significantly here uh, dr sudhir verma dr naresh singla aditya sumeda my colleagues i would like to uh, thank few of the uh, civil society members here respected mr narendra basi ji and his team also and phd students and anup and my ma students they were uh, working in the nights also and they were very supportive in that i would like to also thank amit ji and shiva ji if i have forgot something else or else names please uh, uh, forgive me and uh, needless to say i would also like to thank and that was basically first thank which will go to our both of the speakers of today professor vivek kumar again and professor sudanshu bhushan as you will understand while living in delhi how much it is troublesome to move outside and go to such places so we would definitely like to thank them and would like to if they can cooperate in future also thank you very much sir